that has come up. It is, we are reminded by Iowa. We were reminded certainly during 2016. It started becoming more in the common awareness in 2000 in the wake of the Florida election, if we can call it that, is election securities. How do we ensure that our elections are, in fact, sanctified, sacrosanct, and safe? We have on the line a guest who is going to talk to us about that. Who had, Ms. Kornblatt, who's an expert in the field, please tell us, give yourself an introduction on how brilliant you are on the subject, and then what do we do to ensure our safe elections? Ambassador Karen um, Kornblatt, are you with us in Washington, D.C.? Can you hear me? I can now. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, Karen Kornblue, uh, I really appreciate being on. Um, thanks so much. I'm at the um, Digital Innovation and Democracy Initiative yep. uh, that's in Washington, D.C. And uh, before this, I had been an ambassador uh, for Obama to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is the economic standard setting organization, and also worked for him as his policy director in the Senate and wrote the 2008 Democratic Party platform, um, and uh, have been growing increasingly concerned as somebody who worked on internet policy going way back to the Clinton administration yeah. about how uh, the whole online environment has contributed mightily, in addition to what goes on in TV with Fox and St. Clair and so on. But the online environment has really corrupted our, our media e ecosystem. And we saw going into Iowa and then after Iowa what that can do in terms of making people really doubt um, the information they need as they go into the voting poll and then also the legitimacy of an election. What are the vote systems that you're most concerned about? Are you actually concerned more about what's happening at the ballot, at the vote counting, or at this point most of your focus on kind of the voter psychology, the manipulation that happens upon that with bots, et cetera? Um, your focus? All of the above? Yeah. All of the above. Um, so I have a sister organization here that more works on the actual security of the voter systems, and there are a bunch of organizations working on that. I think people are, are very nervous because of exactly what you saw uh, in Iowa and then also what we're learning belatedly was going on in 2016 with uh, voter rolls, with the election security systems themselves. Um, there's a lot of danger for what will happen at the voting booth, which is to say nothing of even before that, the purging of the voter rolls and the um, voter suppression. Yeah. Uh, and then in addition, I, and I think we're all worried about all of that, and there are a lot of groups working on trying to help address all of that since, you know, we aren't addressing it at the federal level, unfortunately. Um, and But then I think there's a big worry about um, just how people understand what's happening and what the candidates are about um, and and you know, just like authoritarians in so let's start China there. and Russia hurt things and flood the media ecosystem, we're seeing that happening here. So let's start there. Let's start with the psyops. Let's start with the manipulation mm -hmm. of minds and mm -hmm. Twitter feeds and uh, and Facebook posts. Yeah. I remember I'm forgetting her name. There was somebody who used to show up in my feed uh, all the time back in the 2016 election. She was a strong Bernie Sanders supporter, and uh, and she would just she would spend most of her time whacking Hillary Clinton and in a scantily clad T-shirt. And then after the primary, she started uh, showing up my feed less. And then I showed up my feed some, and she was a Trump supporter. And I learned later that. It in fact, she was on the payroll of the Russian government. And and I realized, oh, geez, that stuff was actually going down. There, there really were uh, operatives being paid for by the Russian government to impact our elections. What are the uh, what is the manipulation that we should be watchful for? What advice do you give either what's happening at, at kind of your level? Uh, former ambassadors yeah. working on this and sort of a fancy person. And then what are people doing? Should we do it at sort of my level? Uh, you know, when I'm just like reading Twitter and what should I do? Yeah, great questions, uh, um, but I'll contest that I'm a fancy person. But, um, <laughs> so, you know, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which says how close we are to doomsday, they put out a new clock where they said we're 100 seconds to doomsday, which is the closest we've been. And the first thing they cited was disinformation. Yeah. Because they said what happens with disinformation is 
It undermines democracy. It hurts our trust in each other and in institutions. And we're not able to deal with existential threats like nuclear war, like climate. So it's a big, big problem. And uh, it, uh, we were too late to realize the Russian problem. Uh, and now I think we're going to be we've been too late uh, we need to catch up fast to realize that a lot of it is not is coming from in the house right now. The call is coming from in the house, so it's domestic disinformation, um, uh, not state run, obviously, um, but very close to the state, and um, and also that it's not all ads anymore. That now instead of paying Facebook to run a micro targeted ad, you can also uh, have uh, buy a network through a PR firm that will push bots. Uh, or get a network of people, trolls like you had, um, to bombard either the news cycle or other individuals. So it's more off the shelf. You're paying third parties, um, and it looks more convincing than an ad, you know. Um, and what's happened is the the truth, you know, the signal that you want to listen for to understand what the truth is, the news media has been completely undermined yeah. because all the revenue, you know, that used to go to your local paper from the Sunday circular, well, that now all that ad money now goes to the platforms. Yep. And then when you go online to try to read your paper, if they still exist, if they still had the money to stay in business, all these fake sites that a, a, a reporter for the Atlantic just called Potemkin news sites because they look like they're news sites, but they're really content mills that are just to promote a candidate or to undermine a party are on there looking exactly like reputable 